Good afternoon. This is Iowa Public Radio Classical's Virtual Steinway Cafe, presented by Iowa Public Radio and the WT and Edna M. Dahl Trust. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Marion Lee, coming to you from the campus of St. Ambrose University in Madsen Hall at the Galvin Fine Arts Center in Davenport, Iowa, where I'm the associate piano professor um, in the music department. I'd like to begin today's program with a short work by Sergei Prokofiev called Prelude in C. It's part of a group of seven short pieces and the nickname of it is the harp prelude due to its harp-like effects in the piece. Now Prokofiev is known for his sharp sarcastic character and you definitely get a sense of that in the middle of the piece. But this piece, I chose it because it is sunshine personified. The outer sections are, you know, in the key of C major, an all white key, um, a key that Prokofiev loved composing in. And I felt for the beginning of the new year, um, it, it gave a feeling of hope, of good things to come, and really encapsulates the joy and great, great expectation that comes in a new year. In honor of the upcoming Martin Luther King Day, I'd like to pay homage to a black classical composer whom you've probably never heard before, Florence Price. I'll be playing her second movement from her piano sonata in E minor, written in 1932. Now her greatest claim to fame is that in 1933, um, her, she was the first African American female composer to have had a symphony performed by a major American symphony orchestra. And that orchestra was actually the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Now in all my schooling, I had never heard of Florence Price. And I only came across her uh, through some research that I, I had been doing for another concert in August. Um, her story is fascinating and I'd like to share a little bit with you um, of her. Um, she was born in 1887 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And at the, age of uh, at the age of four, she started playing piano. And she had her first 
published composition at the age of 11. So she had all the makings of a, a real prodigy. And she went to uh, the New England Conservatory and got her bachelor's degree um, in 1904. And it, uh, the New England Conservatory was one of the few music schools that accepted black students at the time. Um, now, despite her accomplishments, when she returned to Arkansas, she faced segregation from an all-white Arkansas Music Teachers Association, um, which was really painful for me to read about because I belong to that uh, music teacher, National Music Teachers Association, and uh, you know it's a blemish on our history. Um, but Florence was um, had to start her own music club as a result and taught at all black segregated schools. So it really underscores how amazing her accomplish, um, accomplishment was in the 1930s for a, um, a black and female composer. Um, sadly, after Chicago, um, her big success in Chicago, she just found racism and sexism too much of an uphill battle to overcome in the t early 20th century. Um, but she did keep composing and teaching up to 1953 when she passed away. And uh, thankfully, her manuscript, manuscript was recently discovered two years ago, and Shermer started to publish them in 2018. So if I had tried to you know, perform her works three years ago, I wouldn't even have been able to find her music. Um, so her story is really amazing, and I hope you look up, look her up, and read a little more about her, and maybe listen to her music on YouTube. So, without further ado, here is the Andante by Florence Price.
One of my favorite composers is Frédéric Chopin. Chopin just had a gift for creating melodies of the utmost beauty, inspired by bel canto singers of his day. When I was young, I had a cassette tape that had Arthur Rubinstein playing all of the Chopin nocturnes. And it was the first time I ever cried listening to classical music. It so touched my heart. And um, so now I would like to play for you his Nocturne in D-flat major, opus 27, number two.
You can tell probably by the first piece that I love Russian music. Um, I actually lived in Russia for three years in Moscow. And I received a Fulbright grant to go study at the Moscow Conservatory. And I arrived in August 1991, just in time for a coup d'etat. Uh, fortunately, it was a failed coup d'etat. Um, they had kidnapped Gorbachev. And I witnessed a historic revolution and the, the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. I'll never forget this incredible introduction to this country and the training that I received, a place where Tchaikovsky taught and Rachmaninoff and Scriabin were students at. Um, I was grateful to be able to watch the rebirth of Russia and all the independent republics. And in honor of my time there, I'd like to perform for you Rachmaninoff Prelude in G-sharp minor. Um, I feel it this piece quintessentially captures the Russian soul, and it reminds me of the winters in Russia, the icy, frigid air and frozen tundras of this beautiful country. And in some ways, it also reminds me of Iowa. Well, in addition to Russia, another one of my favorite countries is France. And Debussy is synonymous with France. Uh, he even has his face on their money. If you can imagine that happening in America, a composer's face on money. <laughs> um, and I just love Debussy's music. And I will be playing for you L'Ile Joyeuse, uh, or translated Joyous Island, which was composed in 1904. Um, this piece was inspired by a Baroque painting by Watteau uh, entitled The Embarkment for Cythera, which is the birthplace of Venice. Um, it's probably why it evokes such exoticism and sensuality. 
Um, but then again, it was also the same time that he had a summer affair with Emma Bardock. So I'm sure that was also an inspiration. For me personally, I, I picture the pictures of Paul Gauguin in my head, um, of his t depictions of life on the French Polynesian islands of Tahiti when I play this piece. I hope you enjoy.
To conclude today's program, I will be playing two works by Dr. William Campbell. Bill Campbell is a wonderful composer and, and an equally wonderful pianist. And I'm so happy to have him as a colleague here at St. Ambrose University in the music department. Um, Bill has m won many accolades in his field of composition. And um, the most recent ones were fr from actually the Iowa Motion Pictures Association this year. Uh, his film score for Sons and Daughters of Thunder uh, won the Award of Excellence. And last year, Bill went to the Academy Awards for his documentary, Lifeboat, which was nominated for an Academy Award and which he wrote the film score to. Um, I would like Bill to say a few words about both of the pieces that I will be playing next. As a performing composer, I really rely on my arms and my hands, and a couple years ago I had to have surgery on my right elbow that put me out of commission for a good month. It was also absolutely frightening to be a musician and think that maybe I'll never really be able to play at the same level that I have been. And for me as a composer, my relationship to the music is physical as well as aural. And I had to go through this process of thinking, will I ever be able to play again? Will I be able to throw a ball again? <laughs> will I be able to do all the exercising and all the other things that I like to do ever again? And so what does one do but start playing left-handed piano music again at the piano because uh, it's part of my daily routine is playing. And I'd never written a piece for left hand alone before, and so that's what this piece is. It's an exploration of those feelings that I was going through, only just for the left hand. And at the beginning, it starts off quietly, gradually moving into the musical space. And throughout the piece, you'll hear moments of frustration and even anger, and then letting go. Finally, we end the music quietly and acceptingly that all will be well all in due time. Thank you, Bill. You know, I heard all in due time when Bill gave a live stream performance back in May in the early part of the pandemic. And um, I was personally incredibly touched when I heard this piece and I knew it was something I wanted to play because to me it captured the hope that one day our lives would come back to normal it's taken a little longer than <laughs> we imagined, but with the arrival of this new vaccine, hopefully, it looks like it will be a reality um, and we will finally overcome this horrible pandemic um, all in due time. <laughs>
Together We Rise is a piece of music about uniting and the power that can be had in coming together as opposed to being individuals, trying to do all of our own little things. It's also a piece about the feelings that all of us have about the um, isolations, about the really difficult political situations that we have, regardless of your political affiliation, and about the feelings that we all have for the people that we love. So Together We Rise is uh, just a piano piece. With that very simple melody line, and through that, um, building out from that in many different directions. Um, not to get too nerdy with it, but there's a lot of music, um, there's a lot of relationships in the music that are using chromatic thirds, a lot of patterns, um, shifting rhythms and meters, time signatures, and this gives a lot of different perspectives on that one single melody line. Um, there's a lot of pianistic movement throughout. Um, I think it's a lot of fun to play, and I think we're going to have fun hearing Marion playing it as well. But throughout the piece, these different perspectives on this one melody, we all want the same thing. We all want to be loved and to love, and it's best done together. I chose this last piece, Together We Rise by William Campbell, because it felt like an anthem for our time. This past summer was dominated by the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter protests, and it still is. In honor of Martin Luther King Day, which is next week, I know together we will rise above these unprecedented times. And to follow in the hallowed footsteps of Martin Luther King Jr., we will never tire standing up for justice and true equality for all. Let us teach our children kindness and dignity to all. Together we rise.
Once again, I'm Marianne Lee. It's been a pleasure performing for you from St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa for Iowa Public Radio's Classical Virtual Styling Cafe. Presented by Iowa Public Radio and the WT and Edna M. Dahl Trust. Make sure to like and follow Iowa Public Radio on Facebook. If you know of someone who would appreciate this video, uh, please share it with them and maybe you could host a watch party. You can stream Iowa Public Radio Classical anytime at iowapublicradio.org. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my incredible team for helping me bring this program to you. I'd like to thank my colleagues at St. Ambrose University, Nicholas Enns, Duke Schneider, William Campbell, and Lance Sadlick, who is the director of the Galvin Fine Arts Center. Uh, he allowed us to use the facilities. And uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, thank Mark Hayes of Top Notch Production. In addition, though, I would like to also thank Iowa Public Radio, uh, Lindsay Moon, Chris Fenton, Bill Wallen, Phil Moss, and the wonderful and very patient Jacqueline Hallbloom uh, with the assistance for today's program. Please check back in February for another Steinway Cafe performance. And thanks again for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week.